the story of the hidden Newton begins when Isaac Newton returned to Trinity College, Cambridge in 1667. He was only 25, yet he had lived through unparalleled political and social turmoil. Civil war, regicide, the plague, and the great fire of London. Newton had been sheltering from the plague for two years at his country home, but it was impossible to escape the religious fervor of the times. As they look round the world through their providential eyeglasses, all they can see is plague, mm. disorder, chaos, the four riders of the apocalypse. Everything goes wrong. It, it's a time of absolute uncertainty. And probably for most people, clinging to their vision of God is the thing that gives them some continuity. People are convinced they're right, and that the people they're fighting are the agents of the devil and the antichrist. He was actually intensely religious. And this is, of course, not the Newton uh, of popular conception, uh, but this is the Newton that we know from his, his personal manuscripts. So he's intensely religious, he's tens intensely pious, and this Puritan ethic, this austere moral code, permeates his entire life. For two decades, from 1667, Newton would be cocooned in his own private world of study. Truth is the offspring of silence and unbroken meditation. He didn't go anywhere. I mean, he rarely traveled. He never went to the continent. He was that insular. I mean, he stayed in his rooms. He worked seven days a week, 18 hours a day. And he pushed himself, drove himself. He had a library of his own that had about 1,600 or 1,800 volumes. But it was very much a world that came to him through printed matter or through manuscripts from others. In the mid-1660s, Newton had made a bold decision. I am a friend of Plato. I am a friend of Aristotle. But truth is my greater friend. Newton had decided to search far beyond the narrow boundaries of the classical teachings for new truths about the universe. He devoured the philosophy of the fashionable French scholar René Descartes. In the early 17th century, Descartes depicted the universe as a giant clockwork machine, created by God, but then left to run. At home during the plague years of 1665 and 1666, Newton had been intrigued by Descartes' mechanical philosophy. But he was suspicious of it. There was no role for God after the creation of the universe. Whence is it that nature does nothing in vain? And whence arises all that order and beauty which we see in the world. Does it not appear from phenomena that there is a being, incorporeal, living, intelligent, omnipresent, who, in infinite space, as it were, in his sensory, sees the things themselves intimately, and thoroughly perceives them and comprehends them wholly? This virtual recluse drove himself to test Descartes' theory. Was the universe really a mass of lifeless matter, or a living world run by God? He became fascinated by the force that held the moon in orbit, and caused apples to fall. Surely gravity was the divine force, not a matter of chance. Newton was obsessive. In 18 months he became the greatest mathematician in the world, and invented calculus, that enabled him to study the movements of planets in later years. A feather 
or black ribbon put between my eye and the setting sun makes great colors. Descartes had said that light was created when a stream of particles hit the eye. Newton investigated whether light and color was created in the eye or by the brain, risking his eyesight time and again. I took a bodkin and put it between my eye and the bone, as near to the back side of my eye as I could. I'm pressing my eye with the end of it, so as to make the curvature in my eye, there appeared several white, dark, and colored circles. For centuries, philosophers from Aristotle to Descartes thought white light was pure, and that colors were produced by modifying white light. Eventually, Newton turned this theory on its head. Using prisms, Newton proved white light is made up of primary colors, the colors of the rainbow. By the late 1660s, word of Newton's extraordinary scientific discoveries spread across Europe, but his religious inspiration was ignored. Newton himself wanted to design a universe in which God was absolutely present and absolutely powerful. There's an enormous irony there. In the 18th century, gangs of interpreters, most of them French, will take the god out of Newton's world, and we will be left with a clockwork universe. I mean, it's a very common image of what the Newtonian world was, that it was soulless, that it was mechanical, that it was a piece of clockwork, that it really wasn't theologically motivated at all. To this day, this purely mechanical picture of Newton's universe is still accepted worldwide. But in Jerusalem lies evidence of the scale of deception that has been perpetrated on generations. Dr. Stephen Snowbellin, an historian, has come to examine some of the 4,000 pages written by Newton that were sold at auction but not bought by the economist Maynard Keynes. What these manuscripts reveal is a very different Newton than most people conceive of. A thinker who had a, a grand, unified project to uncover God's truth, God's true doctrines. This is a, a Newton who is not a cold, calculating scientist. But Newton faced a terrible dilemma the day he had started to climb the academic ladder. he would be required to take holy orders and become a cleric in the Anglican Church. This set him on a collision course that threatened to end in his disgrace. He researched the history of Christianity and became convinced that both the Catholic and the Anglican Church were founded on a corruption of the Word of God. Now, because Newton was so convinced that God is extremely powerful and unique, Newton, as the, as the saying goes, reads himself into heresy. In other words, Newton begins to minimize, to play down, eventually to deny the divinity of Christ. And Newton comes to the conclusion very early on that the Trinity is a blasphemy on the first commandment because the first commandment says that thou shalt have no other gods before me and the worship of the Father, Son and Holy Ghost from Newton's point of view is a heresy. So by the early 1670s Newton had become a secret heretic. He was convinced the doctrine of the Trinity to which Henry VIII had dedicated Trinity College was a form of blasphemy. If Newton had been exposed while he was at Cambridge as an anti-Trinitarian uh, his career would have been over. He would have been ostracized. It's almost certain that it wouldn't have involved uh, being put to death, but uh, definitely uh, prison would have been uh, one possibility.